okay, well, despite all the, 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 the fever and stargazing, unfortunately, it hasn't helped the skies terribly. We've had a, a real patch of, of really, really horrible observing weather. But as from around 10 o'clock tonight, I think the skies might clear a bit, and uh, we might have a bit more luck. That's according to, to, to the weather forecast in the way in anyway, but more of that in a second. But uh, Peter has been busy trying to grab some shots of the sun, and the sun has been very active um, behind those clouds. And you can see this, this little group up here, uh, AR1402. It's been, uh, it's been very, very active, and it's been throwing out a lot of stuff. And here's a, here's a recording from Monday, when there was a huge outburst of material from the sun, which headed our direction. There's like a huge flare on the surface of the sun. The sun's hidden behind this occulting disk, and uh, that material has been thrown out into space. And the media had a frenzy on it over the last couple of, of nights, and they were predicting all sorts of auroral displays. And if you were, if you were lucky, like uh, Martin McKenna, who took this beautiful photograph from the North Coast, um, that's probably the most substantive aurora we've had for, for some significant time. Did anybody else see it, by the way? Anybody? It's Brian down from the North Coast. Brian basically lives away up in Port of Tray, so uh, he, he may have seen it, but uh, I certainly couldn't see it from Bangor, despite rushing back and forward to the, to the, to, to the bathroom window every 10 minutes. I can see nothing other, other than the usual aurora bangoras to the south and uh, Belfast to the north, so there was no evidence of, of any green stuff at all. And you can actually see this in the, the purpley red stuff there too. But anyway, fingers crossed, the main part of that disturbance has probably moved on, um, according to the, the Tea Time News. Some of you may have heard Alan Fitzsimons on the news tonight there, and uh, it is possible it's moved on, but it's possible it hasn't. Um, these things are very, very difficult to predict, and if it gets clear tonight, certainly I would have a, I would have a look before I went to bed. Um, some of you as well, I was talking to Robert Hill, who was in Tromso. Uh, he went off on the Tromso exhibition, uh, mission uh, a couple of months ago, and they never saw anything other than cloud. Well, actually, there's, there's almost an, an aurora display every night in Tromso at the moment, and some of them are fantastic. I was just reading one of the reports in Space Weather on the way up, and uh, it said that it is for some season, uh, Aurora Watchers, it has been the most intense period of Aurora that they've ever seen, and those are guys in Finland. So there's no doubt things are things are happening at the moment in the Aurora front. Now some of you might remember Comet Lovejoy. Comet Lovejoy was the big comet um, that came very, very close to the sun, too close, and it dis dissociated, pulled apart, wrecked by the sun, and it was picked up in one of the solar images. But actually it produced a beautiful comet in the southern hemisphere. As usual, they get all the best comments. And uh, there's, there's a friend of, a friend of ours, uh, lives in Newcastle, just outside Sydney, and he went off. But the comet was actually really visible, something like this, for a couple of nights, uh, and it's now gone. But it had this most beautiful, very, very long tail. And we've still got our fingers crossed that some of these days we'll maybe see another bright comet. Haven't had one for some time. Now the sky is also, I mean the winter sky is, is absolutely superb, it's full of bright stars and anybody was, that was down in Queens would have seen a lot of those bright stars. But it, uh, it, it's, it's, also, uh, it's, it's also quite an interesting part of the sky and I had a few people down all throughed up with the, the stargazing stuff and they came down and I showed them through a lot of clouds, I showed them the brighter stars. And of course the brighter stars uh, of Orion are central to, to everybody's interest at the moment. And, you know, I was telling them that Orion is a fabulous signpost, as well as being a beautiful constellation, and probably the most famous constellation in the sky. It's, it's excellent for finding your way around the sky. And the, the most prominent part of Orion is the three belt stars, as most of you will well by now know. And if you go up the way, in this direction, you'll come to a V of stars, that's the stars the bull. And you can also see the little Pleiades up there as well. But if you go down the way, you come to the brightest star in the sky. Now, Philip, Philip was saying about the star shows in the, in the portable planetarium. And uh, they're very, very, very popular. And I sort of tease people and say, does anybody know what the brightest star in the sky is? And a lot of people think it's Polaris, which of course isn't the brightest star in the sky. But Sirius is the brightest star in the whole sky. And you find him by heading down towards the horizon, and you can see him shining. And here he's in Canis Major, which of course is one of Orion's hunting dogs. And that hunting dog <coughs> is chasing a little hare here. I'm not sure how he became tangled with the whole thing. But uh, Lepus the hair is, 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 is very, very useful, as we'll see in a second. 
Okay, one of the showpiece items in Orion itself, right down in the Great Nebula that lies below the belt, is the trapezium. And uh, some of you may or may not know about the Fox Telescope. The Fox Telescope has actually been used in schools around Northern Ireland. And uh, again, I was talking to Robert Hill through the week, and Robert has been driving the Fox Telescope project forward. And he was telling me that Northern Ireland schools are actually using the Fox Telescope network more than anybody else in the world, which is fabulous. And I went back, myself and I think Barry and a few others, looking into the schools and helping with the projects. Well, this was a photograph that was taken recently, and here you can see right in the middle is the trapezium. And you can see that with your even a relatively small telescope, but uh, the Fox telescope has taken a really, really, really nice view of it. And I was showing people that the other night, and they were, they were greatly impressed. But actually, what they saw wasn't anything like that. They saw a sort of a cloudiness. They thought the cloud had come from the telescope. It's actually quite difficult to see anything in the Great Nebula. Certainly, you don't see those colours. Okay, Taurus itself, it's, it's my favourite constellation. Again, when I'm doing the mobile planetary and star shows, uh, I always say it's my favourite constellation. It's the best one in the sky because I'm actually a Taurus. But actually, it's very, very easy to find. It's very distinctive because there's a little star cluster here called the Hades, which has uh, Deborah uh, right at its heart. And the red eye of the bull is a fairly red star. And it's got the Pleiades up there uh, on the shoulder of the bull. So Taurus is, is a very interesting constellation at this time of year. Uh, and that's a photograph which I took last year of the Pleiades. And you can see the Pleiades is, is enshrined in, in all this nebulosity. And it's fairly easy with one of these digital cameras to take a photograph of something like that um, with several exposures. Now, this is one of the most famous objects in the sky. Um, I'm not doing Terry's teaser, uh, but you can probably guess what it is. Again, it's a photograph I took last year. And I was actually quite pleased with it because this is the Crab Nebula, which is in Taurus. And visually, it's probably the most uninspiring thing in the sky, if you can see it. The Crab Nebula, Messier 1, number one in Messier's catalog, is actually incredibly difficult to see visually. But actually, again, the digital SLR, it's able to pull out all these beautiful um, tendrils of gas expanding. But look out for it, it's hard to find, but if you get down to Delamont, nice dark skies, it should stand out reasonably well. Now, I mentioned the, the deepest the hair underneath Orion. There's a couple of objects in, in Nebus, which at this time of year are reasonably easy to see. And one of them is, is, is Heinz Crimson Star. Now, Heinz was one of these Victorian Japanese astronomers, and they spent a lot of time chasing around after red stars. And I have to say, I like doing that myself. I like to see red stars and chase them around. And they used to make catalogues of red stars. But Heinz Crimson Star, um, or R. Leporis, as it's called, it's just up here. You can actually see it with binoculars, it's quite easy to see. And you will notice right away how red it is. So if you want to see a couple of red stars, have a look at Betelgeuse, which is uh, way up the top of Orion. Have a look down at Rigel, which is blue white, down at the foot here. And keep on going down, and you, and you might just be able to pick out part of course. It's very, 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 very pretty. And there's a nice little globular cluster down underneath these two stars here, which is quite easy to find as well. It's just about the same distances between Alpha and B and course. And there's a picture again I took of M79. So it's, it's fairly easy to, uh, to pick those out. Now just coming on to another interesting constellation in that area, it's, uh, it's Canon's Major, or the big dog, the big hunting dog. It's down here. here uh, here's, here's the hare, here's the big dog chasing after. Of course it's the one with Sirius in it. But it also has a very interesting star. In fact it's probably the largest star that we know about. It's called VY Canis Majoris. And you can see the sun right beside it. But unfortunately I don't know very much about it. But I know a man that does. And I don't know whether he's here tonight or not. But one of our younger astronomers tortures me about V.Y. Like Thomas Majoris. He's going to tell us a little bit about it. William, what do you know about V.Y. Like Thomas Majoris? Go. Shut it out. <laughs> The 
some of you like how this universe will be being standard to the orbit of Saturn. It is a variable star and it's been moving since 1850. Since 1847, it was known as a crimson star, which is a deep red star. In the 19th century, observers measured at least six discrete parts to be like how this universe, suggesting it is a multiple star. The discrete parts are actually bright areas in the surrounding gas and dust. It is one of the most luminous stars, but it is still only seven magnitude. The higher the magnitude, the bigger the star. So you can try. <laughs> Okay, um, what else is happening in the sky? Well, at the moment after sunset, tomorrow night, if it's clear and continues to be clear, over in the western part of the sky, as I say, just shortly after the sun sets, there's a nice lineup of, of Venus, which is stunning in the west at the moment, incredibly bright. And of course, Jupiter is still, still in the sky, and there'll be a nice crescent moon there right beside it. So that's a photographic opportunity tomorrow night. Jupiter, Jupiter was the centerpiece of of what observing we could squeeze in over the start guessing live. And uh, a lot of people were asking uh, the other night we were looking for the, the great red spot. You can see tomorrow night, round about half ten, the great red spot will be right in the middle of Jupiter. Good time to look for it. On the 29th, it's going to be there roughly about eight o'clock. And on the 31st, it's going to be there about half nine. So if you've never seen the, the great red spot over the next couple of nights, good time to see it. The only thing that's in the sky at the moment which is hugely interesting is Mars. Although well, Mars traffic tends to be hugely interesting, but hugely disappointing because it's very tiny and it still is very tiny. And again, this is a, an image which I took in 2005, some time ago now. And you can see on a very good night with good seeing, you might just about be able to pick out the, the little polar ice cap down here and you can see the dark markings. This bit here, it's like the it's like India, it's, uh, it's very famous, it's called the Circus Major. And that's one of the things which we look out for. And over the next month, Mars is going to do one of its uh, its retrograde loops. Now, this is one of the uh, this is where I turn the whole thing off. But anyway, um, what's happening here? Here's the sun. Here's the Earth wrapping around in this direction, the clockwise. And here's Mars going around the outside. The Earth, as you know, goes around much quicker than Mars and will eventually catch it up. So this actually produces an apparent motion in the sky where Mars loops backwards. And that's called a retrograde motion. And if you want to, if you want to prove that over the next know, <coughs> month or so, if you take a photograph every night, you might only end up with two or three photographs. But it would be worth the other. I think Paul did at one time and produced a lovely retrograde uh, loop of, of Mars. So you can look out for that and then have a go at it. For the early risers, and I mean early risers, you have to wait until about two o'clock in the morning. Saturn has come back. And Saturn, you might remember last year, Saturn was edge on, the rings were right out edge on, but the rings are now opening out, and it's starting to be much more um, Saturn that we recognize far easier. Uh, interestingly, on the 20th of February, which is a, a couple of weeks ahead, there's a little star going to disappear behind it. So that's certainly something that I'm looking out for. But a little bit closer, in fact, it's the night before our next meeting, um, one of Saturn's, well, Saturn's brightest moon, Titan, is actually going to pass in front of the star. Now, that is interesting. And it's worth staying up to 20 past one to see. Some of you might remember, uh, must be 20 years ago, Terry, there was a, mm -hmm. a notation of uh, 28 Sagittarius, which was a very faint star by, type, by Titan. And there was only certain places you could see it. So this is certainly an event that's worth staying up with a bit to see. Probably a bit cloudy on the night, but anyway, look out for that one. It's a good one. Just to finish off, um, a couple of weeks ago we had a, a, a speaker who was telling us about the Einstein rings. Well, this apparently is the, is the best Einstein ring that found. It was on a stormy picture of the day, and I couldn't help reproducing it here. It's an almost perfect. So there's obviously something in behind that, uh, that red galaxy that's, uh, that's, that's been gravitationally lensed, and it's produced this beautiful uh, Einstein ring. Anyway, thanks very much indeed. Okay, thanks.